Hello and welcome to Beat the Hackers, Veeam's expert approach to ransomware protection. Today's webinar is sponsored by Veeam and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is Scott Becker. I'm from Actual Tech Media and I am delighted to be your moderator for this special event. Now, before we get to today's great content, we do have a few housekeeping items that will help you get the most out of this session. First off, we want this to be an informative event for you, so we encourage any questions in the questions box in your webinar control panel. Not only will we have team members responding to questions during the live event, but we'll also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the presentation where we'll discuss in greater detail some of the top questions that you have. The Q&A panel is also the place to let us know about any technical issues that you might be experiencing. A browser refresh will fix most audio, video, or slide advancement issues, but if that doesn't work, just let us know there in the Q&A, and we'll provide further technical assistance. Now next, in the handout section of your webinar control panel, you'll find that we're offering several resources, and I'd especially like to call your attention to uh, a few items there from Veeam. There's a public sector edition of Veeam's data protection trends report. There's a ransomware trends report. There's a strategic framework for ransomware resilience. And there's also a link to the Veeam hands-on lab, which I got a look at earlier today um, in another session. And it's, uh, it, it's a really cool resource. Um, also in there, you can find some links to some actual tech media resources like the Guerrilla Guide Book Club and the ATM Event Center. So I encourage you to access all those resources in the handouts and share them with your friends and colleagues. Now third, at the end of this webinar event, we'll be awarding a $250 Amazon gift card to one lucky registrant. Of course, you must be in attendance during the live event to qualify for the prize. You can also find the official terms and conditions of today's prize drawing in the handout section. Just scroll to the bottom past all the other items and you'll find the prize terms and conditions link there. Now, finally, one of the best benefits of an event like this is the opportunity to ask questions of our expert presenters. And so to help encourage your questions, we have a special additional prize for you. That's another Amazon gift card, this one for $50 for the best question. After the event is over, we'll look at all the questions that came in, pick out the very best one, and contact that prize winner. So with that, let's get to today's fantastic content. It's my pleasure to introduce you to, let me bring him up on screen here, Omar Rao, who's a senior systems engineer with Veeam. Omar, welcome. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. No worries. <laughs> yeah. Thank you uh, for take, take it away. Well, Scott, uh, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Omar Rao. Uh, I'm a senior systems engineer here at Veeam. I've been with Veeam for about six and a half years in this industry for over 20 plus years. I lost a lot of uh, time, a lot of gray hairs, you can say. Um, well, uh, I started off uh, as a prankster hacker, um, just to teasing my friends out and my family members. And then I became an ethical hacker uh, where I've won two global hackathons um, and assisted many organizations uh, uh, in the past. Now, today I'm working for Veeam and I'm going to be giving you some of the uh, uh, some of the details related to how Veeam looks at data and also what Veeam recommends in terms of uh, uh, in terms of our solution itself. Now, please know, uh, we would like to uh, ask you if you can ask any questions in the Q&A, uh, because more questions you're going to ask, more you're going to learn. But today, I made this entire presentation a little bit um, spicy for you, because uh, what I did was I brought in a live ransomware attack simulation lab, uh, which I'm going to also show you, but also uh, give you some details related to how to mitigate against uh, uh, ransomware. Now, please know uh, this is a uh, live ransomware lab, uh, so anything can go wrong, but I'm going to try my best so, uh, to make sure everything is being done. Now, please know, guys, um, today, um, data is a commodity, uh, and everybody is after your data. Data is uh, under attack more than ever. It means I have seen organizations uh, hitting by ransomware and other attacks all the time. Uh, I don't know your experience, but let me tell you, uh, nobody's safe. Um, any commercial account I have talked to, any SLED accounts I talk to, any federal account I talk to, all of them uh, are getting some kind of uh, attacks from ransomware. But also, if you look at the statistics, uh, as uh, Scott was mentioning about a uh, ransomware trend report for 2023, it 
gives you a lot of information that 85% of the organization uh, got at least hit by ransomware once a year. Uh, and 45% of the organization were, uh, were affected uh, because their data set got, uh, got encrypted. And believe it or not, uh, the 75%, that is a shocking number. 75% uh, of the organizations uh, have reported that when they got hit by ransomware, the first thing these guys were hitting was the backups. So it's not just Veeam, any, any of the solution altogether. So thinking about that data is not safe and you have to protect it. Now, we had to take a step back and we have to look at the autonomy, uh, anatomy of the attack uh, from the attacker perspective, especially uh, uh, this MITRE attack. There are a lot of steps which comes along the way. Uh, how they execute, what steps do they take? Uh, we had to kind of take a step back. So what I've done is I put together this, uh, this uh, chart to make sure that you understand that it just doesn't happen right away like this, right? So they have to access your system in some way. So whether it's uh, they're doing reconnaissance, whether they're pretending to be a FedEx guy and calling your receptionist and asking, hey, can you click on that tracking number because I'm not getting that details, or they're gonna do some kind of social engineering uh, explo exploit to get in the door uh, from anywhere, right? Whether it's a, uh, it's an IT guy or non-IT guy, it's an it's a admin, uh, depending on the situation, they're trying to coming up with the new ideas. Now, once they access, uh, the, the biggest thing which I always think about and always talk about is the dwell time. Um, like uh, they're persistent, they are always trying to looking and escalating and looking for more privileges. If they're in the system, uh, they're gonna uh, they're gonna try to go and access your credentials. They're gonna try to discover uh, what other resources are available, uh, what systems you can uh, connect to or they can connect to, and what information they can pull out. Right, uh, that is their their uh, their way of looking at it, and this is from a hacker perspective, from ransomware activity side of the house perspective. When there are uh, APT attacks or advanced persistent attacks are happening, on an average, uh, this is as of April 2023. Uh, the average dwell time is about 16 to 17 days. Uh, but I said 16 is now the number is lower, uh, and that number is going lower and lower. That you understand that uh, they are sitting in the system for a longer period of time and they're trying to go in and access anywhere they want to. Now, once that is done, uh, they immediately go into pre-attack, right? Um, uh, and the pre-attack is deleting the backup because if they can cripple your environment from the backups itself, they know that you're not gonna be able to come back on. So they add, they target VMs, they target uh, snapshots, they target replicas, they target uh, storage uh, replicas anything they can go and get, hand, get hold of, right? So they're trying to go in and add, attacking from all angles. Now, once that is done, now please know the, when the attack happens, they, they're very smart nowadays. They attack uh, like on a Friday before the long weekend starts, you know, uh, special days, you know, holidays and stuff like that, because they know that you're not going to uh, uh, come in and, and fix the issue right away or stop the issue right away. So they try to look for that encryption time to begin is at the time when there's a, there's a low time or um, everybody's on a holiday, right? And then they know recovery is can be painful. Uh, and especially uh, you don't have if you don't have any replicas or any kind of backups. So they know that if they attack the backups, they will be able to uh, ask for anything in return, right? So Obviously, understanding the anatomy of the attack is very important, and there are a lot more steps to it, but I'm just talking about it from a five-step perspective itself today. But when it comes to a recovery, uh, you might wonder, Veeam is not a security company, right? We are not a security company. We are, we are the backup company. We provide you uh, the infrastructure or data at the end of the backup, right? Uh, at the end of the attack because you need to rely on a systems uh, or, or a solution like Veeam, which is providing that recovery option, right? So our teams are always there to help you. How we're doing this when we come in and uh, uh, and uh, help you assistingly, uh, assisting you, we always look at for identifying the attack, like what kind of attack uh, happened, what kind of initial reporting you have to do, uh, initial scoping that takes hours sometimes. And then we always go into 
uh, the incident report uh, by declaring the, the attack. Most of the organization do that all the time uh, when they activate the incident response plan. Obviously, it takes hours and days sometimes. And they have to kind of call FBI in that case as well, too, when that happens, because sometimes when they get involved, they're going to bar everything, right? So please know that you're not going to be able to access your own infrastructure if they put a red tape on it. Uh, cybersecurity insurance uh, gets engaged into the mix as well, too. Uh, it, nowadays, it's very common that most of the organizations are going after cybersecurity insurance itself. So insurance is insuring your environment is going to uh, prohibit sometimes as well, which can take uh, hours and days sometimes. And then uh, forensic team, this is external team, is going to come in uh, and they're the claimers. They, they need to approve the claim for the cybersecurity thing, right? That, that really... Uh, that, attack, uh, that attack happened internally. It is not an international attack. Uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of gray areas into the agreements itself. So make sure you're reading through that agreement before you're signing off that. And recovering of your data set can take weeks and hours uh, and months sometimes. I have um, an incident. I'm based in Pennsylvania. I have a organization that got hit by ransomware. Uh, believe me, they were down for 14 days. And at 14 days mark, and the only thing they were regretting was I, they wish they would have multiple copies of data set because what they did was uh, when they got compromised, all their copies got corrupted. So yeah, we were able to help them. Uh, it took them some time to come back on, but apparently if they would have uh, followed the best practices, they would have uh, not gone through that process. Now I'm gonna stop here for a second and I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna kind of take a different step because um, what I've done is, uh, I have put together a small uh, hands-on lab, which is uh, allowing me to kind of express and show you how the attacks actually happen. Uh, most of us who are listening to us is probably they have not experienced like live ransomware attacks, right? Uh, so I'm gonna take you on a journey. Uh, wish me luck, uh, this, can, this is a live environment, so anything can happen. So I'm gonna share my screen with you and uh, see if uh, we can uh, discuss this a little bit more in depth here. So give me one second here. And there you go. Uh, Scott, can you come offline for a second and tell me if you can able to see my screen? Just want to make sure. Yep, yep I see it. Thank That's you good. very, very much. Appreciate it. So guys, uh, uh, obviously I'm not going to be looking at the camera this time, so I'm going to be looking at my other screen. So please excuse me. But uh, what you're looking at on the screen here is uh, my Veeam backup replication server. Uh, obviously, if, if you're a Veeam customer today, thank you. Uh, and if you're not a Veeam customer, we can go into details and give you more brief there. But I would like to keep this uh, very high level so you understand that Veeam is there uh, for you as a backup solution, as a replica solution, and providing you all the abilities for you to go and restore from. Now, what you're looking on the screen is a simple backups, which are being created for some of my backup jobs for my virtual machines. And it is also for some of the uh, Linux machines, which are 1.3 and also my NAS shares along the way. Now, please know these backups are being created beforehand. I did uh, connect that infrastructure to my, uh, my virtual infrastructure as well too. So that means that I have my, uh, my ASXi host also um, uh, running all these infrastructure as well. So Linux one, two, three, my proxies, all that stuff in one place. So I'm gonna simulate an attack for you so you can kind of uh, follow me along uh, so what I'm going to do is, uh, I, I, because I already have all my backups done and all my restore points are already in play, uh, just know you need to keep the restore point in a place where you can be able to restore from, right, in order for you to be uh, able to recover. So what I'm doing here is I just want to show you one thing before I move into. I do have a, uh, uh, a NAS share, which are two file NAS shares, which I have, which has a bunch of files in it. I just created them on a fly. So obviously you can we kind of experience that, that yeah, when that attack happens, what's gonna happen? So simulation is gonna happen now. So I'm gonna take you into my C drive. I have written a code for it. It is not a live ransomware intentionally because I, I wanted to try it, but my, uh, my team did not allow me to do that. So I had to write a script for it. So I'm gonna initiate the attack. The that attack has been initiated. Uh, all I can do is uh, I can just wait and pray um, that my shares are not gonna get corrupted and my environment is not gonna get disabled. But what you're gonna see is that as the attacks happen, uh, immediately you're gonna start seeing uh, a lot of utilization of your CPU memory, right? So uh, when they initiate the attack, obviously the attack is going to be targeted or non-targeted. It's up to what their plans are going to be. 
in this case, when I have done initiated the attack, uh, it took all my NAS shares and corrupted them, right? Uh, SMB share, SNFS shares, whatever they are. But if you look at on the right hand side, my virtual machine, which are being powered on, one of the machines now just powering off itself. I don't know what's happening. You know, maybe it's too late and now it's being deleted, right? Maybe that is a mission critical VM. And uh, I have also have a Linux one machine, which is powered on right now. And I think uh, it is going to go away as well, because as you can see, it's been shutting down itself and not going to be able to come back on. So these kind of attacks, when they happen, uh, they happen so suddenly that, you know, not many people can react right away. Uh, so you have to have some kind of remediation plan in play. You need to think about uh, outside the box sometimes. And once that happens, obviously, you're going to get a Bitcoin information. But in this screen, what she's showing you, yeah, I've been infected, uh, good luck recovering, right? So thinking about an experience that you have, uh, anybody can experience. Now, please know, the first thing when um, organization experience ransomware attack um, is panic. <laughs> please do not panic, okay? If you have Veeam, Veeam is on your side, you don't need to worry about it, okay? As long as you have the backups and they're being corrupt, uh, they're not corrupted, uh, and they're not being encrypted with ransomware attack, don't panic. <clears throat> well, all you got to do is to make a plan, right? Thinking about it. So if you have backups, in this case, I'm going to take you <clears throat> into my backup uh, for NAS shares. So I'm going to start off with, uh, hold on a second. Somebody's telling me that they cannot see my demo. Uh, can you confirm, uh, Scott, that you're, are you able to see my screen again? I just got a comment that they're not able to see my uh, my screen. Yep, I'm still seeing it. Um, I'll, I'll look into it. Okay, please. Thank you. So continuing, guys, uh, please know the recording of this is going to be available for you. So you can come back and you can take a look at it anytime as well. So I have uh, initiated the attack. All my shares are now corrupted. Uh, all my VMs are gone. Um, some are infected. Some disks are gone. So I pre-planned this, all this stuff. So now if our, in order for me to come back on and recover this, all I have to do is to rely on my restore points. So I can go back and I can restore the entire file shares. I can have a rollback to a previous one. But in this case, what I know is all my shares are being corrupted. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an entire file share recovery, uh, simply selecting what shares I want to like to go and restore from. Uh, it is going to load up my restore points, uh, and then I'll be able to go and drill down into which restore point I want to go back to. Maybe I have a clean copy. I can go back to a previous point if I need to. But in this case, I'm just going to select both of them to make sure that I'm selecting and restoring because of time um, uh, here. And also, I can restore to a new location if I need to. Maybe I have a Synology. Maybe I have a Western Digital. Uh, maybe I have a different SMB uh, or NFS share. So depending on your situation you want to go and restore, you have the ability to restore at anywhere you want. Now, in this case, I'm going to restore it back to the original state. So in that way, everything gets over it. But I will be given four options here. So I can go and pick and choose from, right? So if I want to go and skip all these files, if I need to, I can do that. But in this case, I'm going to restore anyways. I would like to overwrite all the files. But the only thing which you need to understand is when I initiate this, they're not going to be replacing the original files. So imagine if you have file name A, B, and C, they're being changed. The name has been changed because ransomware attack. They change the extension. They change the naming convention. So Veeam is not going to see those restore points. So when you're restoring it from Veeam, Veeam is going to restore from the previous restore point, but then you have to go manually and delete those files which are being corrupted. So in this case, what I'm doing is I am actually restoring it anyways. Hitting uh, finish. Obviously, uh, the initiation of the restore is going to start, and then you're going to start seeing... Uh, the file is going to come back on right here. So I'm going to just show you all the processes happening. I can see when the files are getting corrupt, uh, restores, you're going to see all these processes happening within that. And then if I open this up on a side to make sure, just to show you, then yes, I was able to go and recover all these files and these files are back. But I do have the corrupted files. So what I'm going to do, as I told you before, I'm going to select them all and I'm going to hit the delete button and permanently delete. So that's all I have to do to make sure that you are able to come back on with file shares. Uh, imagine um, file share getting corrupted means I can give you an example. Uh, a few months ago, uh, I have my Western Digital uh, NAS at home got corrupted. I had all my pictures, my kids' pictures, my vetting pictures, my uh, all my pictures, which I thought got corrupted. 
thank God I had a copy in a cloud, which I recovered from. Yeah, it took some time to recover because it was bringing back data, but I was able to recover. So thinking about any kind of scenario, whether you have NFS share or SMB share on-prem, you're gonna be able to come back on. Now, in this case, I all had two shares. So the share one has been deleted and I deleted them. Uh, these one uh, says you have to pay us. Why should I pay where I have backup like lean? So I simply delete those options right there and then. So my file shares are now back on. Now, please know before I initiated this attack, uh, I did remember uh, just showing you that I had three virtual machines, three Linux machines. Now, one of the machines are gone, right? So I just need to understand that why that is gone, but I also I can recover. But before I even do that, I just need to take a look at my Linux one. Why this machine got turned off? Uh, so if I need to go and maximize this and show you uh, how this process looked like. So let's do some investigation of our own, right? So I'm gonna go into my data store and I'm gonna take a look at my, uh, my data store itself. In this case, I'm gonna go in my data store files to make sure I can see if I do have the VMDKs attached to those, those machines. So if I look at VMDK uh, for Linux 2, I do, I do see um, a VMDK. But if I look at for Linux 1, obviously, please know this is all pre-planned. Uh, anything can happen, right? So in this case, my VMDK is being gone, right? So I cannot mount this up. So if I power on the virtual machine, it's not going to mount it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to do some kind of disk recovery. So what I can do is I can go back into my Veeam handy dandy, and I can simply pick and choose my disk section, and I can pick and choose my Linux 1. And this time I'm going to do a restore a virtual disk because I know it is a disk which is missing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna initiate the restore. I will be given an option which restore point I wanna go back from. I can just simply pick and choose the recent one and simply hit next. In the disk, disk mapping option, that is where I'm gonna pick and choose that specific data store so I can have this VMDK restored back to the original state. So in this case, I'm just gonna select the VMDK off the next one. I'm gonna hit change and I'm gonna choose the data store from whatever is being connected with Veeam. In this case, I already have the access to the data store. I'm gonna hit okay. And I'm gonna hit next to give a reason and hit finish. So as this is happening, just know what Veeam is doing is, Veeam is not restoring the entire VM. Veeam is restoring that particular disk, which, was got, which got corrupted. So if I just simply wait for a few seconds and I go back into my, um, my ESXi host, which is right here, Obviously, if I have to refresh this, I'll be able to see VMDK getting populated for Veeam Linux 1. So let's give a second here. And here you go. My VMDK is coming back on. Uh, the data is getting written. So I'm going to start seeing the changes and the data will be coming back on. So this is how easy that is. Means I can simply wait uh, until this happens. Or I can simply, once this is done, I can simply go and restore from anytime I want to. So simple as this, I got the uh, everything mounted here and just restored back to the original state. So while this is happening, uh, I also need to think about restoring one of the virtual machine got corrupted, right? Or deleted completely. So I can do an instant VM recovery if I need to. I can do different type of restores. Uh, Veeam provides you all that ability. So in this case, I'm just gonna pick and choose an instant recovery option. So instant recovery is going to allow me to simply mount the backup as an NFS mount and restore it back. And then we can do a storage remotion to bring it back to production later on. So I'm just going to pick and choose a restore point. I can pick and choose the latest one I have. I can choose back to original state or different location. I can simply pick the same location if I need to. Give a reason why you're doing this, right? Maybe you want logs to be done and then simply power on the virtual machine. So if I hit... Uh, finish here, obviously in the vCenter side, I'm just gonna have to minimize this to show you. Give me one second here. I'll try to align this in a way so you guys can see both things running together. There you go. So you, as you can see here, uh, that machine is getting fixed up on the Linux side, uh, but obviously I need to go back into my VMs. So I'm gonna take a look at the VMs. There's VM is not being started yet um, because that process is uh, finishing up for HCVM recovery. As you can see on the bottom right hand side, the machine is getting uh, registered. And as you can see, the VM is now back on in the Veeam side, in the ESXi side. This is a temporary mount, 
But on the Veeam side, you take a look at there's instant recovery option. So now you need to finalize this in order to finish this up, right? So please know, uh, yeah, you're going to be able to come back on and use this virtual machine at any time, right? Um, you can be able to go and uh, web console into it, take a look at everything. Everything will be fine. You can be able to make changes to it if I need to. So please know all that stuff can be done. But obviously, when you need to finalize this, once you go into Veeam side, simply right click, migrate to production. That is a storage motion. You're bringing everything back to production the way it is running. And you can also do a stop publishing if you need to. I really need to do migration to production. So I'm going to turn this machine and turn it into production because that machine uh, got corrupted or moved or deleted in the past. So I'm just going through the step here. I'm going to initiate this restore and the restore is going to happen automatically. And that is initiated. Uh, I do not need to do anything different. It's just happening in the background and you will see all the activity happening on the bottom right hand side. Beam is going to power off, power on, all that storage of motion along the way. Now, last thing I wanted to talk about here is um, obviously when the backups do get corrupted uh, and you're not sure what you need to restore from, maybe certain things got corrupted too. Right. So Veeam does provide you the ability to scan the backups before you restore. So you have the ability to use instant recovery option. Let's say if you want to go and use a restore point, you can restore to a new location or a different location. Veeam provides you an ability to do a scanning of your workload before you move to production. So if you have an AV in play, like Symantec, ESET, Crowd, Cloud, CrowdStrike, uh, anything which has command line uh, AV, Veeam can actually use those command lines to scan before we restore. Now, if you don't have any of them, Veeam is going to use Defender to make sure that you have that ability to go and restore from and make sure you're going to be able to quarantine the issue before uh, that becomes a problem for you. Simply scanning it will take some extra time to go and scan, but once it's scanned, everything is good to go. So this is all about uh, Veeam itself, so please know uh, do not panic when you have a copies of backups you can go and recover from. You don't need to worry about at all at anything uh, about anything. So I'm going to have to take you back into my presentation mode. I'm going to continue uh, some of the conversation there. Um, so let me know, uh, Scott, can you see my presentation again now? Yep, you're back to the deck. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So a few things uh, Veeam is uh, you need to think about. So if you're a Veeam customer today, as I said, uh, thank you for being, uh, Veeam, being a Veeam customer. And if you have not upgraded to V12 yet, please do think about upgrading to V12 because Veeam is going to provide you a lot of options you can pick and choose from. So starting off with the Linux hardware repository. So having an immutable storage on-prem. Now you can have different type of immutable storages in play. You can have uh, something on-prem, you can have something in the cloud, you can have uh, uh, some kind of DDO appliance, you can have a, uh, a tape environment in play. So thinking about immutability or offline backups, uh, you can actually have different options. So you can pick and choose a simple uh, simple box, which is uh, which has a bunch of disk in it and make it as a Linux hardware repository for you. Uh, or you can buy yourself uh, a storage in the cloud or an object storage. Amazon S3 uh, and Azure, Wasabi, list goes on and on. They're providing all that immutability option at any time. Now, please also know that uh, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to recovery, right? So if you have Veeam, uh, Veeam provides you not just one way of backing up data, right? You have not just one copy of data set. You can have a, a continuous data protection, having an RPO to the lowest as possible. You can also have replicas. You can actually do a whole space replication from point A to point B data center. Uh, you can rely on your backups and you can rely on the storages. But at the end of the day, you have to reduce the risk, save the time and restore with confidence. Now I'm going to give you three examples here. Uh, and these scenario examples are live examples. I just want, I cannot give you the name of the organizations, but I just want to give you understand, I, I will give you the, uh, the, the brief that you will understand that, yeah, anybody can, can, uh, can get affected with ransomware. And the people will always say, hey, you know what? I have a Fort Knox environment and nothing is going to come through it. I'm sorry. There's no 100%. There's always 99.999 and how many nines you want to add it. Uh, the first uh, scenario which I want to talk about is the ESX, ESXi host uh, getting affected. Uh, you'd be surprised to know uh, this uh, is a real uh, use case uh, where the customer was using 6.7 uh, with update 3, I believe, with the latest patch. Um, 
and they got hit by ransomware. Uh, all of their hosts, uh, the vCenter, uh, internal networking, uh, nothing got exposed specifically, so they got some saving, uh, but also a few web server in DMZ uh, who were connected through VPN and edge file firewalls uh, got, got affected. Uh, some of the virtual machines were encrypted. All their virtual machines were renamed, <laughs> right? That was a pretty weird one because once you have renaming, then you can restore back everything originally from the original state, but then you have to remap everything. But it took time to for us to go and restore. Thinking about a scenario where uh, all the virtual machines were powered off, uh, could not power on uh, from the physical uh, servers, uh, and the physical server specifically were not affected in the entire scenario. Uh, the biggest thing was uh, from Veeam server, that Veeam backup server lost its connection to the vCenter. And um, it was a panic mode by the customer specifically. So what we were able to do was, we were able to take all the virtual machines, uh, created uh, and restored back to a new vCenter and the new ASXi hosts. Uh, there were no guest, guest in guest uh, infections found. So we, uh, uh, we had to do uh, all the uh, AV or, scanning before we were doing this, make sure that everything is uh, is clean before we're restoring back to production. And we were able to come back on with the last good restore point we had. So yes, uh, there are many scenarios out there. Anybody can, can, if this can happen to anyone. So the second scenario I wanna talk about, uh, this is an operating system ransomware attack, which is a time bomb and a silent threat. It sits in the system for a long time, cannot be detected. So Veeam does have a small solution called uh, Deep Scan uh, with uh, Shore Backup. Uh, for those who know what Veeam has a solution for Shore Backup for a long time, uh, Veeam just enhanced that capabilities in version 11 now in version 12, where you have the ability to use this engine to scan any of those environment in an isolated environment if you need to. Now, the scenario you're looking at the screen here is on the right-hand side, I have my Linux hardware repository. Now, think about this is a box with a bunch of disk in it. Um, uh, install uh, Linux or Ubuntu on it uh, and format it under XFS. And then it's used as a target, as a mutable target. You can write data once, ca cannot delete data after written once, right? You can read as many times you want to. So, worm method is being done on that Linux hardware repository. On the left-hand side, I have my ASXi host running some VMs, and then I have done my Shore Backup, which is a virtual appliance, which we implies to the ASXi host, which run for scanning purposes. Now, in the event something does go wrong here, so what happens is that we mount the disk from the hardened repository because we can mount this uh, read as many times we want to, but cannot be deleted. And then once that is being done, we uh, isolates, uh, creates the isolated lab, uh, lab, which allows us to do any kind of scanning, right? And then once that is done, we mount those VMs, which are part of it, uh, into that virtual switch to make sure that you are scanning it against any kind of malware signatures or anything like that. Uh, Veeam does ping tests, application tests, blue screen tests, and AV testing along the way. Now imagine uh, the report is going to give it to you by email, right? But if you have something found, what's going to happen? So Veeam is going to detect it and going to say, hey, you know what? While doing this scanning, we were able to find something in there. Right, so imagine that can happen. Sorry, I went by a little bit faster here. So just gonna show you that message again. As you can see in the center, uh, right top right hand side, it just shows you that Defender was used uh, to scan and we found the detection and obviously we were able to quarantine it or stop it, whatever you like to do as the next steps. Now I would like to take that to the next level. Uh, the next level is around clean mass restore. Veeam as a solution provides you a recovery orchestrator process, which allows you to scan uh, uh, your, not just uh, scanning your backups, but also automating your recovery process. Like if you heard about DR runbook capabilities, uh, having the ability to create a entire DR plan beforehand. So recovery orchestrator can do that for you. The, on the screen, you're looking at a small screenshot in the center. Uh, it is, um, uh, it's a ransomware recovery process. And if something has been found, Veeam is going to allow you to define how many restore points you want to try or how many times you want to scan. And then also having the ability to uh, run the scan uh, uh, against any kind of AV. So if you have a Defender, for example, uh, it will tell you that, yes, Defender has been used to scan anything. And let's say if something has been found, yeah, you're going to be having a DR runbook. You're going to be able to go and uh, get that report saying, hey, you know what? Yes, you did the testing on the VMs and the entire DR scenario, but ransomware was found. 
And that is the kind of report which an auditor is looking for. So let's say if an auditor knocks in the door uh, on knocks the door on your organization and asks you that, hey, show me what your DR plan look like. Cybersecurity insurance companies do ask them for it as well. So you can actually make that plan beforehand and you can run these testing if you need to, uh, when you need to do a mass restore if you need to as well. Now, the third scenario is undetected. Uh, undetected scenario uh, when the encryption start is very uh, difficult in some scenarios, but Veeam has a solution called Veeam One for monitoring. Uh, if you are using it today, thank you. If you're not using it, try it. It is a very cool solution for monitoring. Uh, it can monitor not just physical, virtual, cloud workloads. Uh, it will give you detection. It will give you reporting capabilities, so many different things along the way. Now, when the encryption do start, uh, please know that when encryption start, the Veeam agent uh, automatically falls into successful backup for the last full backup. Uh, and then uh, Veeam has different editions of product. So this Veeam one is available through our advanced or premium editions. So obviously talk to your sales guys. They will tell you more about it, that how to go and upgrade that process. But yes, advanced has uh, Veeam backup application and Veeam one as a product together. Once the detection is being found within Veeam 1, Veeam is going to alert that for you in the live environment. It will tell you, okay, you have uh, something detected on Veeam 1. Uh, it will tell you the cause and resolution along the way if the encryption has happened. Now, if I take you to the next level, let's say if there's a suspicious uh, backup size. So imagine if I'm backing up a 10 MB file uh, and all of a sudden that 10 MB file becomes a 2 MB file. Yeah, the, encryption, uh, the, the incremental size has changed but it is going to be detected for you. So you have the ability to go and rectify it right there and then. You can actually put a remediation step and say, if that happens, alert my incident response team, alert me, alert the entire team, whatever you like to do, you have that ability to do that within Beam 1. In addition to this, uh, thinking about uh, detection of, uh, by uh, detect detecting the anomalies along the way. So obviously you have the ability to use this, uh, the this section to make sure that you can see how big is your, uh, your, your backup size is. You will be able to see if you are putting everything in a mutable state, how long your mutability is for, all that good stuff along the way, including deduplication and compression ratio along. And then if something is do found uh, in the process of backup, Veeam is going to alert you on the job level. We'll say, hey, you know what? Uh, the last five backups you had, everything was 10 MB. Now all of a sudden it's 2 MB. It's an alert. Yeah, we did backed up, but I just want to make sure that you understand and you go back and take a look. So yes, the warning sign means that it's not failed. Yeah, I did backed up, but now it's just giving you for you to go and check on. Now with meme one, you'll get an alert. You will be able to go and fix it at the source or the target itself. Now talking about Linux hardware repository, I know uh, not a not a lot of uh, a lot of our customers are using that option for on-prem immutability, but there's a lot of good reasons why you can have an immutability on-prem. Now I know different companies are, are offering immutability, uh, especially in the object storage itself. But let's say if there's a need for you to keep data on-prem in immutable state, you have the ability to do that at any time. Uh, you can make anything in immutable storage, right? So you can have a simple box with a bunch of disk in it, and simply as I said before. Format under XFS, uh, install real nine or any kind of Ubuntu, and then use that as a uh, as the Linux hardware repository to land data. So, in addition to all this stuff, I want to continue uh, with uh, some of our certs. Uh, please know that whatever you're using within Beam is certified, ISO certified. Uh, all these certifications through NIST uh, is being followed. Uh, we are trying to make sure that we're catching up to all certifications altogether. And if you are looking for references, Veeam has a lot of federal customers uh, who are our, our references, our customers itself, and a lot of them are using Veeam today uh, from DoD to anything you can think of. Now, lastly, uh, I would like to talk about uh, what happens if, you're, if you are affected by ransomware. Veeam does have something called uh, ransomware warranty for $5 million. Uh, there is a process you have to follow. Uh, there is advance onboarding. Uh, there is a quarterly health check requirement. Uh, Veeam will provide you a dedicated uh, SAM, uh, dedicated uh, support account manager, which will help you along the way. And the process of coming on board is as follow. So you 
have a seven step process. If you have not learned about this, uh, just know that you need to be our uh, all platform customer. So premium customer, that means you need to be having Veeam backup application running, you need to have Veeam one, and you also need to have orchestrator as a product. As long as you are, are using all three products today, uh, you will be able to go and get that $5 million uh, warranty for, uh, for any kind of uh, stuff happens with ransomware attacks. Now, boarding, onboarding starts with uh, getting started. Uh, architect is going to size everything to make sure uh, we are planning along the way with you, uh, protecting your data loss if that happens. Uh, we're providing you a master restores and providing you an executive debrief to make sure that you are doing all these stuff on a quarterly basis. So more details will be following. If you are interested, uh, just uh, ping us and we'll provide you that details. Uh, something I always encourage, uh, if you are not leveraging it today, uh, please start doing it now. Uh, health checks are for free forever, right? So you can actually contact any of your technical account manager and uh, you, they will be able to go and schedule a time for you where they can see uh, and give you some feedback about your environment as well. I do health checks every day. I give recommendation, best practice recommendation all the time. I look at the environments and I tell them, hey, you know what? This is what you can do to improve. This is something you can do to um, uh, to make things easier. Um, Veeam providing uh, that health check all the time uh, is going to give you a small security checklist, a small report to make sure that you can go back and start applying those uh, changes along the way. And this can be done on a quarterly basis if you need to. One thing you want to take away uh, from this is all about recovery today. Uh, anybody can do a backup. Uh, uh, like literally, uh, there are hundreds of vendors out there who is providing backup solutions. Yes, we can do backup. We're another one uh, in the list. But at the end of the day, it's going to be all about recovery. Uh, when you're recovering with Veeam, uh, Veeam is making sure that you are recovering all of your restoring apps, you're recovering uh, with confidence, and you have access to all different type of restores altogether. Now, please know, um, this is not an eye chart. Uh, this is 105 different ways you can restore. Imagine 105 different ways you can restore. You can have 106th one. And if you found one, 106th one, let me know. I will go back to my marketing and I will tell them, hey, you found the 106th way. But 105 different ways you can restore are, I think, more than sufficient for us. Now, just to give you an idea, uh, if you have... Uh, phones and cameras, you can actually take a screenshot of this. Uh, this is a very cool information. QR codes are there. Uh, on the top right-hand side, this is my personal favorite site. If you're a Veeam customer today and you're looking for some best practices, not the user guide details, but best practices coming from heart, make sure providing you the ability to go and fix the issues and finding out more details. Uh, VeeamBP.com is, uh, is a great site for architects' uh, recommendations. Uh, and you can see it for both Veeam Backup Application and our 365 console uh, along in one place. In the center, you have Community Hub. If you're not participating on Community Hub, uh, please know Veeam, when Veeam comes out with a new product, Veeam is uh, looking for your, your feedback. So if you're looking for certain features or certain functionality, go hit the, uh, hit the Community Hub. Uh, ask for it. Uh, there are product developers who are always answering. I'm on the security team as well too, providing you uh, the answers. And also on the bottom left-hand side, you have uh, some white papers you can go and study through as well. Please know that Veeam has been around for a very long time, all right? It's been years. Uh, and uh, on the Magic Quadrant, we are six time, matter of fact, this is, needs to get updated, but six time in a row, uh, we are on top right-hand side of the Magic Quadrant. Uh, we are uh, uh, being recognized by IDC, Forrester, and other uh, credit rating agencies as well. So with that being said, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to start taking your questions. So if you have been asking questions, and I think Christian is doing a great job answering them, um, obviously he's going to be giving me some questions with Scott, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, great, great presentation, great demo. Um, we had a question from Matthew that has to do with the demo. He was, he was saying, in your example, uh, that we restored data and then you removed the encrypted files, does that mean we need to double the hard drive space on the machine when restoring the data? Uh, not particularly. It means it depends on the size of the data set. So if you are restoring something to a temporary basis, it's simply a temporary NFS mount. So you're mounting the file. 
and then restoring it when you do a storage in motion. So you'll be given option to go back to the same location or a new location of your choice. But it's up to you at that point that if you want to pick and choose a new location, yes, there will be a different space. But if you go back to an existing one, then it overwrites the space and you save the space. Okay. All right. Super. Um, so you showed the, the Gartner chart. Eric is wondering, how do you compete with Rubric um, in specifically their, their threat hunting capabilities and malware detection within backups? Absolutely. Well, I they're all great solutions altogether. Uh, what I can tell you, they are all appliances, right? So Veeam is a software-based solution. You can actually make anything an appliance, right? Um, yes, in terms of capabilities are concerned, Veeam has uh, in our next release, which is coming up very soon, uh, is called Inline Entropy Detection. Uh, that is going to be looking at the uh, ransomware uh, or any kind of signatures, which are variants or vulnerabilities, on a fly. So let's say if you're doing a backups, it's not just an anomaly detection, it is also an anomaly um, rectification as well too. So that is something which Veeam is going to be providing along the way. Uh, yes, uh, Rubrik and others, uh, they have a third party solutions they're partnered up with, uh, and they're using that as a third party solution. Veeam has everything all on Veeam made. So obviously this is uh, something which Veeam has advantage on. In addition to all this stuff, uh, one thing I can tell you is, uh, Veeam only keeps only one port open on our Linux hardware repository. Just simply ask them how many ports you have open. The answer is not going to be less than 80. So if you have 80 different ways you can come in uh, versus one, which is secure, yeah, I will choose the one option. And lastly, but not least is um, uh, I have experienced this a uh, few weeks ago uh, where somebody got into their appliance to an NTP server, date and time server. So imagine they harden everything and somebody got in through the NTP server. So imagine uh, you can harden everything you can, but at the end of the day, we're not a security company. We're a backup company. We're providing you a solution uh, before it becomes a problem. Yeah, you know what? Uh, we are providing you the ability to protect and harden the data set. Yeah, we'll take some time for you to go and adopt, but I, we can definitely circle back with you uh, to provide you some best practice and feedback there. Okay, great. Um, another one here, uh, you mentioned your hackathon experience, but the, the, the question here is hackers are getting smarter by the second. What do you recommend about how often we should run pen tests or even review our DR strategy? Well, pen testing, if you're not running it, I think you're making a big mistake. Uh, you should be running it every quarterly basis or at least uh, twice a year. Uh, it will give you uh, all the loopholes you have in your system, uh, networking, application, anything you can go and plug on. Uh, when I recommend pen test, I came from pen testing world. I was doing red team, blue team testing as well too. Uh, yes, it just gives a lot of information for you to go and go and plug those holes. If you are proactively doing it on a regular basis, it is just awesome. And then having a DR plan in play uh, with, let's say, an orchestrator um, that in the event something does go wrong, what to what to do. Uh, would you be able to calling somebody? Would you be calling FBI? Uh, what, what are the steps going to be? So making that plan beforehand uh, is very important. And I do recommend running it on a quarterly basis, though. Okay, great. You know, there's a related question here I want to jump to. Uh, Sarah, uh, uh, they're saying, I've been told by my cybersecurity insurance agency to have a DR run book in place. What do you recommend? Yes. So when we say DR runbook, um, we say uh, DR runbook in a way that you are planning everything ahead. So Veeam has a solution called Veeam uh, Availability Orchestrator, which allows you to uh, allows you to plan everything ahead. That means that which VMs you're going to be testing on a regular basis, uh, how often they're going to be testing, what kind of reports you want to go and pull, pull out. In the events, if you are doing replication, let's say you have two different data centers, and one data center goes down, well, what the failover step is going to be, uh, what order of VMs you're going to be powering on. In the event, if both data center goes down, what steps you're going to be taking. Uh, you have the ability with that process to go and uh, restore to Azure and run everything in Azure. So planning everything ahead is important. Uh, yeah, orchestrated product, if you have not tried it or tested it, um, just reach out. We can definitely give you a demo and provide you more details there. Okay, that sounds great. We've got some more questions. If you don't mind, I'm going to pop us back onto the resource slide so that if, if anybody missed the opportunity to grab that, um, some of those QR codes, they can they can get them. 
Um, and also don't forget about the handout section. Uh, there's a lot of great resources in there too. Uh, here, here's a specific question. They're, they're wondering, setting up Linux hardened repository versus immutability in the cloud, um, what's more feasible for a, for small to mid-sized environments? Wow, that's a good one. Um, so Linux hardened repository will provide you the ability to have immutable copies of data, which cannot be deleted, cannot be altered. Uh, it's like a missile key you need to match before you delete something, right? Uh, where do you do it? You do it on-prem or you do it in the cloud? Yeah, if you do it on-prem, you're going to be spending some money on a hardware. Maybe you already have a hardware. If you want to go into the cloud, let's say in object storage, uh, you go to Wasabi, you go to AWS, you go to Azure. Yeah, they do offer that offering uh, as a part of their uh, package. Uh, but the data set is going to be in somebody else's data center. The cloud is somebody else's data center. So at the end of the day, it's going to come down to where, where you'd like to have your data. Would you like to have your data near to your heart or you want to give it to somebody and somebody like AWS Azure? And the cost is there too. Uh, I if, if I have to give you a percentage, I have about 70 to 80% of my customers in SMB to mid-market using um, uh, cloud today. A uh, small portion are using uh, immutability on-prem but they do want to keep it on-prem intentionally just in case that if something happened to AWS or Azure. Good question though. Okay, gotcha. Great. Um, another question, how many copies of data are enough to protect against ransomware? Uh, that's a good one. You can have as many copies as you want, but I'm not going to be uh, giving you a number saying, hey, have 10 copies of your backups, you know? Uh, I think three copies are more than enough. There is a there's a rule we, we follow, it's a zip code rule called 32110. Having three copies, two different medium, one being off-site, one being offline, and zero for testing. So if you're following three copies, uh, that will be more than sufficient. Now, these copies can be different. Can be backup copy, can be a replica copy, can be a storage snapshot copy. So you have that ability to go pick and choose any different type of repositories or copies. Mediums are gonna be important too. So imagine if you have only one medium uh, and that goes down, then you need to rely on the second medium. So we does not say keep three different mediums, uh, keep only two. Offsite copy is, um, is gonna be a good copy because uh, think about uh, different authentication to go into. Uh, if I'm a hacker, if I try to go into your on-prem environment in order for me to go crack into AWS, I have to hack AWS, which is, I know, and you know, it's not possible. Uh, so thinking about that one clean copy, maybe you want to keep one copy as offline. Uh, maybe you're still running tape in your environment. Uh, tape is still existent. You can keep an offline copy. You write something to tape, you take it out, you know, just in case it's completely offline. I have seen people using external hard drives, you know, as, uh, as a copy. They plug it in every week and they keep seven days and then they plug it out and they put in seven days for another one. Or you can have a Linux hardware repository and say, hey, you know what? I want to like to put everything on a Linux hardware repository. Uh, it's a Linux box, writing once, read many. Uh, and matter of fact, the SSH is turned off on that machine as well. So that means that if somebody is on the network, they're not going to be able to see anything on that machine. So, and testing your backups is very important. Means I ask customers to, do you test your backups? They always give me an answer, say, yeah, I, when I did the last restore, it, it worked. <laughs> but that's not the right answer, right? So uh, last time I did this event, I gave the example of a bank where my friend uh, who called me and said, hey, Omar, uh, I cannot find any clean copies on the tape. And I said, did you brought everything from Iron Mountain? He said, yes, I did, but there's no data on a tape. Finding out that the guy was writing data on a tape, but putting all the tapes in an electromagnetic vault, which was erasing everything, and they were shipping out all those tapes. Imagine he had a lot of clean tapes. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, you can make a lot of money on eBay. <laughs> so yes, you can have as many copies as you want, but think about three is more than enough. If you want to keep more than that, it's up to you. Good question, though, okay. Scott. All right, great. Well, I think that's probably a good place to leave it. Um, Omar, thank you so much for uh, for being here and and uh, share your wisdom and and the uh, the the demo and and uh, taking all these questions. Really appreciate it. Anytime, thank you. 
All right. Well, with that, um, we have one more piece of business, and that is the uh, the Amazon gift card prize drawing. And the winner of the $250 Amazon gift card today is Katie Vang from California. So congratulations to Katie Vang. We'll be in touch to get you your card. And with that, on behalf of the actual tech media team, I want to thank Veeam for making this event possible. And I want to thank all of you for attending and for your great questions. That concludes this event. We hope to see you next time.